hopefully that makes sense. Again, as I go through this, remember that we'll be doing Q&A at the end. So I won't be answering questions like while we go through the content. So anything that comes up, if you've got any obviously general questions, if I go through something a little bit quickly and you just want to clarify it, pop it in the q and I'll do my best to get to it at the end of the content block. Um, as you'll see, when we go through our slides, they have um, the little kind of study design dot point that matches what we're going to talk about. I think this is a good way of reminding you guys that summarizing your notes based on the study design is really helpful. This is something that I learned from doing psych and I applied it in year 12, remembering that I did psych in year 11. Um, and I wish I did it like at the start of psych 3-4. Um, basing things around the study design, especially because you guys have a new study design as well, just makes it like makes you certain that you're addressing what you need to address. I remember when I was writing a psych chapter summary, it was something, I think something that's been taken off the study design. It was like leading questions or something like that. I don't know. And there was a case study in our textbook and I copied the entire case study into my notes and it was like so many paragraphs and it was just a case study. Um, and I remember after writing, I thought like that's, it was the biggest waste of time. Like it wasn't a specific case study that was referred to in study design or anything. And so stuff like that, you need to know when you're writing something that is irrelevant or unnecessary and that won't really help you with your learning that much. Um, and when you should be writing things down, but I'm vital that you're going to be assessed on. So therefore, if you have like something like, like you can literally write the study design dot point like this at the top of your page and then write your notes on that topic from there. And that can just help like you're always referring to it. Like you'll know, you know, you're going to refer to the central and peripheral nervous systems. You know, you're going to be talking about conscious, unconscious responses, stuff like that. Um, so that is personally what I'd recommend. I would also know um, for the 10 marker, and this is something that you'll probably focus on only a little bit later in the year. Um, but knowing the study design really well can help you a lot with your 10 marker. So that's what I would encourage as well. Okay, so essentially we have um, lots of this emphasis on the nervous system. And basically with the nervous system, just understand communication. Like just think that the whole purpose is communication. We're talking about um, sending messages from different parts of the body to the other and kind of allowing the body to interact with the environment. That's basically what it is summed up. So receiving information, processing this information, and then initiating a response in response to that information. So just think something coming in, figuring out what to do, our body, something goes out, we act in accordance kind of with the environment. Um, in terms of our branches, we've got the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you can see outlined in the study design, it, oh my gosh, study design, are the roles of the different subdivisions. So you'll need to know kind of this following diagram that we have here in terms of how they're broken up. So we have the peripheral nervous system. With psych, things are named very nicely so that you can remember them based on like their actions and stuff like that based on their names. So peripheral nervous system, peripheral, the periphery, the outside of the body, central nervous system in the center. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So your brain, your spinal cord, like just think literally the center of your body. Peripheral nervous system, everything on the periphery. So basically your limbs, everything else. Um, in terms of the peripheral nervous system, that splits into our autonomic and our somatic. And then the autonomic splits into your sympathetic and parasympathetic. You need to know this really well, um, especially understanding sympathetic and parasympathetic comes from the autonomic. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to stress as well. But really, really understand this diagram. With psych, um, draw your diagrams, draw your flow charts, draw your mind maps, everything like that to get the content in. Like you can see, this is so much content as we'll talk about. Um, and if you can summarize it visually in diagrams like this and just remember that sort of stuff, that can help. Um, okay, so we'll look at the central nervous system first. So basically the peripheral nervous system is on the periphery. So that's what kind of interacts directly with the environment and that will send a message to the central nervous system central nervous system obviously think about the brain everything the brain does and then it'll send that back out to the peripheral nervous system um so basically the brain we're thinking about processing and coordinating a response the spinal cord basically like a highway of neurons um which are those cells essentially in the nervous system that send those messages along so we can see here it's um, if the brain does everything in terms of processing that response and deciding 
what to do, the spinal cord allows that message coming from the brain to go back to the peripheral nervous system. And obviously initially the message that was coming from the peripheral nervous system to go up to the brain. Um, so think about that as well. Also something to be aware of is sensory information comes towards the brain, motor information will come out. So we think of an acronym, um, you'll hear this a lot, it's SAME. So sensory afferent, so afferent means to come kind of inwards, and then motor efferent, so motor messages, motor information efferent. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but just be aware of that sensory and think like sensory, like sensation, you're picking up something. It makes sense that that's receiving information, um, and then motor coming out. Okay. The peripheral nervous system, um, again, basically everything outside of the brain and spinal cord, and there's our sensory and motor stuff there as well. So somatic think soma, the body, this is when we think of, especially like our voluntary movement, our skeletal movement. Um, we're thinking of detecting things like um, temperature and stuff like that, like, you know, detecting stuff like your skin, detecting sensory things. Um, you know, as I'm sitting on the chair right now, the somatic nervous system kind of detecting that I'm sitting on the chair when I'm applying pressure to my hand, detecting stuff like that. Um, so the main thing that we think about is this idea of skeletal movement. So like voluntary, voluntarily moving my arm, things like that. Um, that is the main thing and that's what you'll associate it mainly with, but just be aware that we're still thinking about sensory information as well. Um, so you can see here afferent and efferent. So sensory is the same as afferent, motor is the same as efferent. So that acronym is SAME, S-A-M-E. And you can see that's an example of an acronym. Um, if you can make your own up or you can become aware of other acronyms and memory aids like that, it can really help you kind of summarize content. Okay. And then lastly, autonomic, when you see autonomic, think of automatic, it's basically all these things that you don't necessarily think about. So you're thinking about your organs, your glands. Um, so you don't, you know, tell your stomach to start digesting food. You don't tell your glands to start releasing hormones voluntarily. The autonomic nervous system just does that. Um, so you can see that they're self-regulating. Okay, so then the autonomic nervous system splits into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So sympathetic basically think, um, again, we'll talk about this when it comes to stress, but you're thinking about um, activating the body. So we're thinking about supplying energy to the muscles and enabling us to um, like survive. It's like a survival kind of mechanism. So just think about really kind of getting the body like wired up. Um, so we can see increasing the activity. It can be triggered by a stressor or a fear stimulus. So that's when we'll go into stuff with stress. Um, and you're thinking about, you know, hormones such as adrenaline, like, you know, think about where you've heard adrenaline before. Um, it's when you're thinking about, you know, when you're stressed or when you're excited for something and you're getting really worked up basically. Um, so you can see that physically as well. So your heart will start beating faster. Your breathing rate will increase. There's other ones. Um, other changes as well. The opposite of that is the parasympathetic. So this is when we're thinking about calming down. Um, so you can think like um, stimulates sympathetic, peace, parasympathetic. My teacher used to tell me, and it stuck with me, I think I, I like it. Um, it's like parasympathetic, think of parachute, like when you're falling and then you pull your parachute and then it just drifts down kind of calmly. So that's when you can think about parasympathetic, like kind of calming the body down, slowing everything down. Um, so this is what is basically dominating most of the time. So obviously, hopefully when you're sitting watching this, when you're in class, most of the time, your heart rate isn't going crazy. Your breathing rate isn't going crazy. Your parasympathetic nervous system is dominating most of the time and you're relatively calm. Um, I want you to think of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic as like a seesaw maybe rather than a light switch. So it's not that the sympathetic nervous system turns on and off and the parasympathetic turns on and off. They're kind of constantly, yeah, like think of a seesaw. Like if you're running away from a lion, your sympathetic nervous system goes heavy on the seesaw and the parasympathetic nervous system, you know, is just put away for a little bit. It's not this kind of on and on, on and off response. It's just that they're kind of always one's dominating the other basically. So this is a table that you 
should um, essentially remember, I'm not going to go through it, um, but basically think about when you get anxious, think about when you get nervous and all this stuff that happens. So lungs, obviously breathing rate increasing, pupils dilating, um, your digestive system basically shutting down because it's a little bit irrelevant. You don't need to be digesting your lunch if you're running away from a lion, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so look at that again in your own time, but ultimately you will need to remember these kind of things because they have come up in multiple choice questions before. Okay, so in terms of a conscious versus an unconscious response, it's really what it sounds like. Um, so a conscious response, we're basically think of being conscious, being aware of it. It's a voluntary response. Um, so often we think about, again, voluntarily moving a muscle, things like that. Um, so the example there, kind of being aware, you're putting on sunglasses because the sun's shining. That idea of interacting with your environment, you've detected that the sun is shining brightly. Your brain is thinking, hmm, what should I do? I'll put sunglasses on. An unconscious response, however, obviously unconscious. So it doesn't require that um, awareness. You're not consciously making this decision or initiating this response. Your body is doing it um, without your awareness, essentially. So we're thinking blinking, heart beating. Again, lots of autonomic stuff or stuff with organs, you might think. Um, so a spinal reflex, we're thinking of an unconscious response because you don't willingly or voluntarily initiate a reflex. Um, so this often, again, is talked about in the context of survival and things like that, like when you're touching a hot pan, um, when you're maybe like pricked by a needle, stuff like that. Um, as you can see with the example, you're touching something hot, you pull your hand away, you don't touch it you know, the message doesn't get sent to your brain and you're thinking, mm, what should I do while your hand is set on fire? You do it instantly. Um, so that's your spinal reflex. And that is something that you have to be aware about. So again, I'll talk through this generally. Um, look back on the diagrams if you have to. So basically we have our sensory information coming in. We're touching something hot. This goes into our spinal cord it does not go to our brain. This is a really important thing with the spinal reflex, I think. Oh. Um, yeah, without any involvement of the brain. Super important to be aware of that. So um, your finger detects the heat. It goes to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, there may be an interneuron. Um, so an interneuron, basically its role is, as it suggests, interneuron. It just sends a message from one neuron to another. So your sensory neuron detects that heat sends it to the spinal cord you've got an interneuron that relays that message and then your motor neuron will move the arm so it makes sense sensory detecting the sensation of heat motor movement of that arm um, and so you can see that is done extremely quickly we're thinking detection send it to the spinal cord send it right back out to the arm and move it so that's your spinal reflex and you can see at no point does it go to the brain and does the brain say, okay, yep, yeah, yeah, good idea. Like, let's move our hand away from the heat. Um, again, because it's this idea of kind of this survival mechanism. It limits the amount of damage caused to your hand. Um, and you can see that with other certain reflexes as well. However, the spinal reflex does not involve the brain in this little reflex arc. The message is sent to the brain later on. So that's why when you touch something hot and you move your hand away instantly, you'll detect pain after your hand is away because that message is being relayed to the brain. It's more like, it's like an FYI um, saying like, hey, you know, we've just done this. And so then that's when you detect that pain, but that's after the fact. Um, so just be aware of that. That's really important. Okay, so in terms of neurons, I want you to pay attention to this point on the study design, um, it's the role of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are what are released by neurons and they essentially enable the neurons. So remember, these are the cells in your nervous system to communicate with one another. In the old study design, there used to be stuff where you had to actually like know, um, like it outlined the parts of a neuron. That isn't listed anymore. However, I've still kept these in these slides because I think it just can help for a little bit of of completion. Um, but I do want to emphasize that on the study design, there's no longer that dot point explicitly saying, um, you know, know the body parts, not the body parts, the specific parts of a neuron, the specific roles of the different parts and things like that. Um, but again, I think it is a good idea just to have a bit of awareness because 
if you're going to talk about neurotransmitters, I feel like it does make a little, or it helps to kind of add that context of what a neuron looks like. Um, so in general, we're thinking of basically it's just a nerve cell um, and its whole thing. Remember how I talked about the nervous system, the whole thing being communication, essentially. Um, so the neuron is the individual cell that enables that. So again, communication is the huge role here. Um, so this is what it looks like. Essentially, the message comes from this side of the neuron to the next. And just think of like a billion of these in a row. You're just getting, you know, from the dendrites to the axon terminal. So in this diagram, it's left to right. You're just thinking left to right. So dendrites through the axon terminals of one neuron, the next neuron, dendrites, axon terminals, dendrites, axon terminals. And that's how the message passes, you know, from the neurons in your um, finger to the neurons in your spinal cord to the neurons in your brain. So just understand that I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail, um, but understand that dendrites are just receiving that message. It's just being passed through the axon and then through the axon terminal. And so the axon terminal of this neuron is going to communicate with the dendrites of the next neuron. Remember how, what I talked about? Dendrites, axon terminals, dendrites, axon terminals. And that's where our neurotransmitters come in. Um, so maybe I'll talk about axon terminals a little bit. So we can see basically that at the end, um, the definitions can be a little bit interchangeable. I'm not going to like axon collaterals. You don't really talk about stuff like that. So you have your axon terminals. They're just, as it suggests, the terminal end, you know, like the end of the axon. And then they have this little bit on the end called a terminal button. And that's where your neurotransmitters sit, basically waiting to be released, waiting to transmit a message. Um, and that's essentially what allows the message that is currently passing through this neuron to exit within these neurotransmitters to then be conveyed to the next neuron. So you can see that here. Um, so these are the neurotransmitters waiting at the end of this terminal button. They're just kept in these little sacs and they will cross this important little gap that we call the synapse. It is tiny, but it's that little gap between one neuron and the next. So this would be the um, axon terminal of the what we call the presynaptic neuron. So the synapse, presynaptic, before the synapse, you've got the end of one neuron. And then you have the dendrites where the receptors are from the postsynaptic neuron, so after the neuron. So you can see that here, postsynaptic, so after the synapse, presynaptic. So it makes sense. The presynaptic neuron is sending a message to the postsynaptic neuron. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, so this kind of crosses here. We've got our neurotransmitters and they will bind to receptors again on the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. They'll initiate a response. That dendron, sorry, that neuron, so the postsynaptic neuron, now that message is being passed through, again, it's the same thing from the dendrites to the postsynaptic neuron's axon terminals. And then the same thing will happen. It'll send neurotransmitters to the next neuron and then the next neuron and the next neuron and the next neuron. So that is a very brief overview. Hopefully that makes sense. The part that is emphasized in the study of design dot point is the actual role of the neurotransmitters themselves. So be aware they are a chemical substance. So they're a little chemical molecule. Um, in like neurons, when they're passed through the axon, you'll see a lot of this stuff like action potentials, electrical impulses in your textbooks and stuff like that. So when a message goes through a neuron, it's electrical. When it comes like out of the neuron, so with the neurotransmitters, it's chemical. So understand that the neurotransmitter is a little chemical molecule. Um, so we can see here it binds to the receptor sites, what we've just talked about of the postsynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron releases the neurotransmitters. So just think again, the names are very helpful. Presynaptic, postsynaptic, you've got your synapse in the middle, your neurotransmitters will head across. Um, okay, so this idea of having an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. So basically with this diagram here, these neurotransmitters will bind and then they'll initiate a response in the postsynaptic neuron. And that can be either excitatory. So that will tell this neuron, you know, fire, like send this electrical impulse, send this message to the other neuron, to this neuron, to that neuron, like fire, 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 like keep sending messages. Or it can be inhibitory. Um, so it's saying, 
stop firing. Don't send as many messages as you were sending before or stop sending messages, stuff like that. Um, so neurotransmitters that you have to be aware of, glutamate is really important. This will come up in learning as well. So glutamate is excitatory. So remember this, excitatory neurotransmitter. So we're thinking about stimulating the presynaptic neurons. It's telling them fire, fire, fire. And think about that. Therefore, it does make sense that it would be important in learning because when you're learning something, you're building more neural pathways, you're connecting neurons together. It makes sense that glutamate is involved because you would want those neurons to be firing together stronger. So we're thinking excitatory. On the other hand, we have GABA. Um, so this is our inhibitory neurotransmitter. So basically just the opposite. Um, so this is when we want to calm down our neurons. Basically, if we've got neurons firing a little bit too much, GABA will be sent and it'll tell them calm down a little bit. Um, good way to remember this, glutamate equals go, GABA equals slow. Again, just a little like jingle, I guess you could call this. If you can make your own for other parts of the study design, again, really, really helpful memory aids. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Again, this is more of an FYI because the lock and key process was outlined on the previous study design. Like it was written, you have to know the lock and key process. Um, that isn't there anymore. So again, this is just for completion, I would say. Um, but yeah, there's a bit of a less of an emphasis. Essentially, it's just this idea of what I've shown you before of the synapse of the neurotransmitter binding to the receptor on the dendrite. It's like a lock and key. So you have to have the right neurotransmitter in the right receptor. It's not a one size fits all. So the receptor that accepts glutamate will not accept GABA, will not accept any other neurotransmitter. They're spe specific. It's like a lock in a key. So that's the kind of main thing there. Um, okay, this is new with this study design, so neuromodulators. Um, so we're talking about dopamine and serotonin. Basically, the difference with our neurotransmitters and our neuromodulators is that they can have sort of both um, effects. They can modulate, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so we can see here excitatory and inhibitory effects um, and kind of it's a little bit more complex than just the excitatory and inhibitory. So like, um, you know, fire, 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 or don't fire, they can modulate things a little bit more. So we have dopamine. Um, again, you may have, you may be familiar with these two essentially. Um, but we're thinking about, there's quite a few roles for dopamine. So balance and movement. So we're thinking about actually like physical stuff and particularly things to do with the cerebellum, um, and different areas of the brain but also pleasure and rewarding behaviors. So often you'll hear about, um, you know, like in addiction and things like that, like dopamine um, can be a reason why, you know, you want to, you can get addicted and stuff like that because this idea of it being involved in like the reward system of the brain. Um, so it can be both excitatory and inhibitory and something else with neuromodulators, this idea of it being released from a neuron far from its receptor site. Um, so with our neurotransmitters, we're thinking about the synapse. It's tiny, right? So we're just crossing from one neuron to the next, very, very close to each other. Whereas with dopamine and some other neuromodulators, they can be really far away from their target cell. And we see that with serotonin as well. I'll explain this in a second, but it also acts as a hormone. So hormones travel in the bloodstream. And so therefore they can go really distant areas. So Compared to our neurotransmitters, which go from one neuron to the other and the synapse is tiny, our neuromodulators or our neurohormones, they can go from a neuron pretty far away from the next neuron or the next cell, the next organ, whatever it's targeting, they can be quite a distance. Um, also, this idea of influencing effects of other chemical messengers. So that's, again, that kind of modulation part of it. So dopamine, yeah, think about pleasure, rewarding behaviors, movement as well. Um, serotonin, we think about particularly with sleep and mood, um, it's called like the happy hormone. So think about that, um, again, levels of that in the brain can determine, you know, how happy one feels, how sad one feels, stuff like that as well. Okay. Synaptic plasticity. Um, so we're looking at long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So again, these are processes. See how it's processes more so than certain definition-y stuff. Um, 
This is new for the study design, sprouting, re-rooting, and pruning. Those come up in one, two. They may have come up in like the previous, previous study design. Um, but yeah, basically there will be a lot of resources with sprouting, re-rooting, and pruning. So don't really be too worried about that. Um, and you can see we're already kind of introducing this concept of memory formation and learning as well. So understand, you can see how I'm talking about the nervous system as part of area study one, and we're already linking to stuff in area of study two. You see that all over psych. Um, everything is linked. Everything is like the concepts all kind of share similar stuff. So again, mind maps can be really, really good, especially when you get to the end of the year and you're trying to remember all of unit three and all of unit four as well. Um, okay, so neural plasticity, basically it's this idea of plasticity being able to change. It's not being rigid. It's not that a neuron is stuck in the form that it's always in. And that's therefore how we can learn new things, how we can forget things, um, how we can remember things as well. So neural plasticity we have here, how the brain's neurons are able to be changed in terms of their actual structure, in terms of their function as well as you learn new things, as you experience things, as you age as well. Um, yeah, so essentially neuroplasticity and synaptic plasticity, they're used pretty interchangeably, I would say. Just like think about the words, neuroplasticity, neuron, synaptic plasticity, specifically the synapse, relatively interchangeable. Okay, so we've got our sprouting, rerouting, and our pruning. Think of the words again. So sprouting, like a shrub, like a little tree sprouting. Um, we're getting our new neural connection. So we're thinking of new pathways. Rerouting is basically this idea of um, the neural pathway once went this way, now it's going that way. We're just changing the route. And again, this may be due to damaged neurons in particular. Basically, you've just got the same synaptic pathway, but it's just taking a different direction. Pruning, think about, you know, pruning your hedges and stuff like that. It's getting rid of stuff that we no longer want to be there. Um, so if this synaptic pathway isn't being used very often, if we're not using these neurons a lot, if they're useless, um, we'll get rid of them because the brain is always, especially with learning and memory, we're always just wanting to be really efficient. Think about, you know, glutamate, you're wanting to excite the next neurons so that every time you recall something, it comes quicker, it comes faster. And that's why, you know, when you learn ultimately like this stuff, it may be all very new to you in January. By the time it's October, by the time you're in your exam in November, you'll be able to recall this stuff really quickly. Um, so that's the whole thing with learning. The first time you're quizzed on something, it may take a while. The neurons trying to sort themselves out after you constantly, constantly, constantly revisit that pathway when you're revising, when you're doing your practice questions, when you're being taught stuff in class, these neural pathways are getting more and more efficient and then it's getting easier for you to recall the information. So that's why this stuff is really important. And the whole thing is just to create that sort of efficiency in the brain and to get rid of things that aren't serving a purpose anymore. Okay, with long-term potentiation and depression, these are basically opposite processes. So potentiation, we're strengthening synaptic connections, depression, we're weakening them basically. So long-term potentiation, again, very involved in learning. Um, Basically, it's this idea that we can see um, the main part is this third sentence. So the postsynaptic neuron becomes more and more responsive to the presynaptic neuron. It's like they're a little pair, basically. So the postsynaptic neuron is thinking this neuron is always sending me messages. It's always, um, you know, telling me to do this. I'm going to strengthen my relationship with them. The connection is going to become stronger. So that's like when you know, you're learning a language and you're revisiting the same words, the same topic. You're constantly revisiting this. Again, the brain is thinking, hmm, this neural pathway is always being activated. Let's make it stronger. So the postsynaptic neuron will just become more receptive. You might get more receptors. You might get, you might get more neurotransmitters being sent. Basically that connection is becoming stronger and the time it takes to kind of get the message through won't be as long. So it's more efficient. On the other hand, we've got long-term depression. So this is when the brain realizes this neural pathway is never being used. These two neurons, they don't talk to each other that much anymore. Um, let's break them apart. So we're getting a decreased strength. So we're getting less firing. Um, and it's this idea caused by lack of stimulation. 
So the postsynaptic neuron thinks, like, just think of them getting more distant, basically. So we've got maybe less receptors. We've got maybe less neurotransmitters being released because the brain realizes, I don't need to put my resources into this neural pathway anymore because it's not being used. So hopefully that makes sense. This is just a bit of a visual display. So you can see long-term potenti long potentiation, more neurotransmitter scent, think more receptors. Things are just tying together a lot nicely. And again, this is because we're getting repeated activation of this pathway. The opposite for long-term depression, we're getting less neurotransmitters, less receptors because of less stimulation of that pathway.